welcome this morning. We have a special treat for you. We are unrolling a website, unveiling a website, uh, that we have developed in conjunction with um, Cindy Vestergaard and the Danish Institute for International Studies. Um, and so we're very excited and pleased to share this with you. Uh, before I start introductions and everything else, may I remind you to turn your cell phone ringers off. Uh, and this is webcast um, for those of you who are joining us via the web. Um, first, I just want to uh, give thanks to our whole external relations team and the folks who, even though their names may, I don't know if they appear on the website, but um, uh, it's, this is really their baby. And that's um, Paul France, Johnny Harris, <coughs> Beverly Kirk, Ali Boers, uh, and the rest of our ER team, they did a fantastic job. Um, Cindy Vestergaard is going to walk us through the website. Uh, she is the creator, <laughs> not only of this, this website, but also the project uh, as a whole, Governing Uranium. And then we also have, we're pleased to have uh, Melissa Mann with us today, who's president of Urenco USA, Inc. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit something about the uranium business, you know that Melissa's not involved in uranium, but uh, she's a user of uranium. Urenco is a uranium enrichment consortium. So, um, and then we'll have a, a short discussion and open the floor up to questions. Uh, but first, Cindy, we'd be very uh, happy to have Cindy as a visiting fellow uh, a little while back here at CSIS while we were working on this uranium project together. Uh, with her. She's a senior researcher in Copenhagen at the Danish Institute of International Studies and formerly with the Canadian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, she is also a member of the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition. You may have seen some of her work on the CSIS website, on the CWC and Syria, for example, uh, and also a member of our Fissile Materials Working Group. Um, Melissa has been in um, the nuclear business for, uh, for a long time. We're not going to say how long, but she's a, an expert and a, a wonderful colleague. And she is really uh, not only knowledgeable about uh, the ins and outs of uh, industry finances, but also on the nonproliferation end of it, including an export control. So I'm going to turn over the floor now to Cindy, who will introduce this project. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to be back at CSIS. We have a lot of fun when we're here, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to this morning. And also, I want to uh, also extend my, my huge gratitude to those at the back of the room, Paul uh, and Ali and the team, because this is, is their creation. Uh, they took this data and created this. Um, so why don't we start with the, the intro video, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. questions. Uh, oh, a pylon. <laughs> These three questions, where does uranium come from? How is it processed and shipped? How is it protected and regulated? These are the three questions that the website attempts to answer. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's meant to be an education and information tool. There is no promotional message. Uh, it's up to the reader to decide if they're for or against mining or uranium uh, or the nuclear energy or power. It's, this is not our objective. Our objective to, is to provide this platform of information. 
and I think it's, it's quite jam-packed. Um, so I'll, I'll take you through the, the parts where the user can really benefit from what the, the various tools and, uh, and chapters that are there. And, uh, and basically it becomes this one-stop shop specifically for, for uranium security, if we could call it that, uh, and safeguards. Uh, the, the target audience, therefore, is, is the general public, certainly, uh, civil society, uh, media, and again, trying to provide this kind of neutral uh, platform for this information. And also for new suppliers who are entering the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, one of the things with the project, which I'll introduce here in a second, is that we have found a lot of new suppliers, particularly who come to the fuel cycle, have no nuclear legislation in place at all. So they're kind of building everything from scratch. Uh, and their understanding of what is involved at the international level, even though it's limited, there are requirements. And so this is also one of those platforms to be able to help them, uh, at least with the initial uh, understanding of what everything could be required. So this is an, an interactive, for, interactive format for the Governing Uranium Project, which was launched in January 2013. It's a two and a half year project. Uh, it's led by DIES, the Danish Institute for International Studies, and it involves up to 25 researchers globally. So CSIS, for example, did the US country report. Uh, we have uh, uh, in total actually seven of the nine facto and de facto uh, nuclear weapon states country reports being done. The only two we have not being done is Israel and North Korea, uh, for obvious reasons, I, I do think. Uh, not that actually we didn't try um, for, for a couple of them, but we kind of knew where they were going to go. Um, so all of those reports uh, have actually been published. There's just uh, one on, on Pakistan that's still, still yet to be published. India was just published three weeks ago. And then there's also, and we're looking in total at 15 countries, uh, producing and consuming states. So along with the seven uh, possessors of nuclear weapons, we're also looking at major producers such as Australia, Canada, Kazakhstan, uh, smaller ones such as Brazil. And uh, Africa, we have Tanzania, Malawi, South Africa, and Namibia. Uh, there was talk about whether we should go into Niger, but there were a lot of security concerns for, for researchers to go. One of the things that is important uh, for the research is field visits and being in country. Uh, so the, for example, with the possessors of nuclear weapons for, like CSIS, but also France, Russia, it is done by researchers in those countries. Uh, also for language purposes, but archives. And so it's very much across uh, and brings in this global network of, of research. Uh, the project is funded by uh, the MacArthur Foundation. We received $600,000 from the MacArthur Foundation. Huge thank you to them uh, for recognizing that the front end of the fuel cycle rocks. Um, <laughs> we do like our puns, and, and I'm not going to apologize for them. Um, and, uh, and also uh, in part funded uh, by the Danish Institute for International Studies as well. And for my just a kind of a quick background, Greenland is also a big issue for us uh, because it is a new supplier, even though it's with, within Denmark. It is looking at potentially mining. So a lot of the things that we're doing internationally do have domestic uh, benefits within the Kingdom of Denmark. So this is an interactive format, taking this research, basically it was kind of like a data dump um, to the external uh, services group here, and they were able to take all this wonderful facts and information and chunk it down into a variety of graphics and photos, uh, stories, pop-ups, little kind of case studies that pop up. Can we uh, walk through that now? Yes, that? I want to take us through first to the China, to the China one. So for example, oh sorry, the supply one. So we, one of the things we also try to do is show how the market shifts, market shift. Uh, this isn't to, to show any kind of fear factor or anything, it's just to show how they shift over time. And this is the current shift we're in. So Kazakhstan has taken over as, as the largest supplier in the world. Canada is now number two, Australia three. If we were to flip this on the, the number of resources, Australia would be first, for example, but they only mine. Um, they don't mine all of their resources. Can we, for, for let me just take a, a quick poll. How many of you know a lot about uranium in this audience? No, okay. okay. Well, so that's about half. But for the other <laughs> half, what, what kind of, you know, just, just big picture uranium? What's 
the market, you know, in terms of uh, or, or production, and you can see from this graphic that there's a lot uh, concentrated in just a handful of countries. Yes, that's true. Uh, and and Canada, Australia, uh, and Kazakhstan, as you can see, it's it's way more than fifty percent. Uh, we're talking uh, if you do the math. Um, but and then we have these smaller smaller ones. And, and this has been shifting, and also the, the spot price has really kind of shifted as well uh, over time. So since 2007, we had this, I would call it a bubble, um, that went up, and, and we had around $137 for a spot price of U308. Uh, per pound. Per pound. Yeah, per pound. This is also one of the things I should highlight. We do, at times, get a mix between short tons, metric tons, pounds. Um, U308, uranium ore concentrate, and ore. And so uh, if there's any clarification there, please. Or if you see a mistake on this website, let us know. Please. <laughs> it might, yes. might have slipped through the cracks. And it's actually been something we've, we've actually had a, a, a challenge with across uh, all, all the board. But basically here, so there is shifting. And then we have these new suppliers. So um, maybe we could use Malawi as an example here, Paul, for a second. Uh, no, the, um, the little beautiful graph, yeah. Uh, Malawi is the world's newest supplier. Uh, they entered in in 2009. As you can see, incredibly small country, uh, and same thing there. They actually, they would be a case study in what not to do to start off with. Uh, they actually started mining before they had nuclear legislation in place. And the Malawians will say, that's not what you should do. Uh, it creates a lot of cost uh, and, and redoing things uh, that you can do from the beginning. So they started in 2009. Uh, in 2011, they put in their legislation. And within a year or two, they actually became, they went from zero to the 10th largest supplier. So this is just an example of how things are shifting. Uh, with the low spot price, however, Malawi then, uh, the, the mine that they had went on care and maintenance uh, last year. 2013, yeah. For the new suppliers, are they doing the, the, themselves or are foreign companies coming in? All of this is, uh, is foreign uh, companies. So Malawi, it's actually an Australian company uh, called Paladin that uh, um, came in there. Malawi also has, I think it's about 10 different countries doing exploration. Uh, now, a lot of times exploration will be done by a variety of different uh, foreign entities, but then they will sell to whether majors or, or kind of a medium company in, in the Paladin case. Sometimes you do have junior companies that want to um, become medium over time. Uh, if we can just go to China, then I can show how also what's happening in if this idea of a nuclear renaissance, uh, if we talk about that. So China is a fascinating case as well. Uh, it's uh, hungry um, for more uranium, and that's because it's producing a lot of uh, more plants. And what's interesting about China is that it has actually kind of exploded uh, in terms of its number, sorry for that term, for its number of power reactors since 2000. Uh, so they had six, and then now they've increased by 90%, up to 20. Uh, we, they have currently have 28 reactors that are being constructed with another 50 to be planned down the line. So their current uh, need for uranium supply is around 4,000 tons at the moment, and I'm, metric tons uh, per year, and they need up to 10,000. Oh, we need to change those tons on that, just as a note. Um, and then uh, they need up to 10,000 tons by, by 2020, and then so on, even increasing more when they get another additional on. And they're looking for that uranium abroad? Abroad, and uh, mostly in Africa. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right now, uh, the, the world's newest mine that's being currently under construction is Husab, and that'll be the world's largest second uh, mine. World, yeah. Uh, and that one, actually, there was discussion about that it's, actually, it's not following market price. They, they need the uranium, it's, uh, uh, and it's, it's going to be a massive mine. And Where that is, is that in located? Namibia. In Namibia. And so these are the kinds of case studies, and, and as Paul had kind of shown before, when you click on, you can get these little pop-ups, and there'll be a paragraph or two of, of basic information uh, about how the market has shifted in that little country and what is uh, the main nuggets that kind of pop up from, from the research. So the first chapter goes through production and consumption, uh, as we're showing here, how the market has, has shifted over time. The second one is the, what we call the pit to port. Uh, now, it is meant to be uh, illustrative because 
some uranium goes pit to conversion facility um, and, and do not have a port uh, in between. But pit to port is basically to show how uranium travels along within the fuel cycle and then actually goes uh, from the mine and the mill to conversion refining and, and the conversion facility. And this is where we highlight too that there are five countries in the world that have commercial conver conversion facilities. So everything has to go uh, to these facilities. And we'll just take you through a transport example. This is uh, one of the longest transport. And this uh, is from Australia and it starts off in Olympic Dam. And then it goes through multimodal road and rail to Adelaide, stops over in Auckland, and then goes to Fiji and onwards, both to Canada and Australia, and sorry, Canada and US, and then goes by road, by truck, to either Blind River for the refining or to Metropolis, which is the only conversion facility in the United States. That is 20,000 kilometers right there, or around 12,500 miles. That is actually not the longest uh, transport route. The longest transport route was actually from Australia to Russia. Uh, and because it didn't go this way, it went this way. Uh, so it was, I can't remember the actual kilometers, but it's, uh, that was the longest that that was ever done. And that's, we've only done that once. The Australians have only done that once. But otherwise in Africa, for example, they travel by truck to port. And there we're talking around um, 2,000 kilometers uh, there. So they do travel incredibly long distances, these drums. And they go through a variety of transfer of authorities. And so this is also what we're trying to highlight, that there is physical protection in place. Industry does use what we call prudent management practices when it comes to securing these drums, also safely securing them, and making sure that they get uh, to port, uh, that they're sealed and tracked along the route. Uh, so that is an incredible, uh, incredibly important thing, I think, that we highlight within, within not only the website, but also what we have found within the um, research. Then we have um, the, the next chapter basically goes through uh, what we call order bomb. It is very much focused on nuclear weapons. Who has them? Talking about testing so that we do have that component in there uh, that cause, because the focus is security and non-proliferation on this site, we want to make sure that we also highlight that the public is aware of what the different relation, what is fissile material, for example, uh, and, uh, and then taking them through that. The fourth one is where we get into non-proliferation and safeguards. And this is probably the most dense in terms of wording. Uh, and you can't really do a picture of safeguards, right? Um, I mean, you have that, exactly. Uh, or if uh, we could maybe update that for an IAEA inspector. Uh, but but that kind of boring, I guess, for, for a lot of people. But safeguards, what we've been finding in, in the project is that because the international regulation uh, over or guidance over the very front end of the fuel cycle up into conversion is very limited, and particularly the, the new suppliers are having a challenge with understanding what these reporting requirements are or even that they, are, that they even exist. Uh, and they are minimal. It's a basic reporting requirement. Uh, but the IAEA is also in the process of moving what we call the starting point of safeguards further forward into the front end. So this has huge implications. Uh, the first moving uh, the line happened in 2003. And so whereas before you had to report only uh, exports and imports of yellow cake, let's call it yellow cake, uranium ore concentrates, what was coming in and what was leaving the country, that had to be reported to the IAEA. In 1997, the additional protocol came along, and then there was more reporting on how many mines you had, uh, what was their capabilities, capacities, uh, which ones were shut, which ones were operating, these kinds of things. Then the IAEA in 2003 moved it further forward and said basically captured urinal nitrate, which is in the conversion process. So whereas before it would be considered the product of the conversion process, now it's moving further forward into the conversion itself. So this has huge implications actually for Canada. Uh, the Blind River facility for the first time became fully captured by IAEA safeguards. Now the IAEA is even looking at bringing it further forward. 
And this uh, could and will have a potential on the product of mills. So they will then start to having to be f under full material accountancy and control. Not just reporting of how they're moving uh, between countries, but actually the full accountancy that goes with it. And that will um, capture a lot more facilities than what happened in 2003. So this is also an attempt to try to, to get that further for, uh, moving or understanding as to what this means. And the reason why we focus on security and safeguards, um, why safety isn't on here, for example. Safety, there is a lot of information already out there on. And we are non-proliferation wonks uh, in, in the project. And, and because non-proliferation and security issues hadn't really been looked at at the front end. And when we're looking at nuclear security, it's about the entire fuel cycle, not just highly enriched uranium or, or waste. Uh, it's about having a culture, of course, that goes across uh, and also understanding the requirements. And the IAEA is also looking at and has developed a, a technical guidance on how to apply prudent management practice to the very front end of the fuel cycle. Uh, so this is kind of where this all comes together. That's uh, any questions that kind of come out of the safeguards part before I just say what we want to do with it next. Well, I think this is a perfect lead-in okay. to, to yeah, sure. let Melissa. <laughs> so one, one of the questions that I have as you're talking about um, expanding safeguards is there are certain financial implications yes. of that um, and, and business, you know, it affects business practices. No, that's right. I mean, I think one of the things that you, you talk about most often in the uranium market is what is the price of uranium today, okay? And I mean, it is tracked in some cases by the hour. Um, so the people who do uranium sales are, are just, they live and die around that price. And so the, the price today is just a little over $38 per pound. Okay? Uh, that tells you that some of the mining resources that are in the ground are not going to be economically mined at that price. Uh, you know, when we saw the price spike up to the $130, $150 per pound level, uh, there was uranium coming out of everywhere. Everybody thought they had a, a you know, a lively uh, pit that they were going to exploit. So when you get down to the current market prices, and the market really is uh, in, in what we would call the slump, any additional perceived cost means that those pounds are going to stay in the ground. And so you have mines that are only economical at, you know, maybe it's $20 per pound, maybe it's $40 per pound. In some cases, it's $70 and higher. And so I think uh, on the mining side, there's a concern that if you start adding additional regulatory requirements beyond those they already have, uh, that that just further hinders the, the ability to develop that resource. Um, so that's, that's the first, uh, I think, bit of anxiety that you might get around this changing regime. I also think that part of the industry has missed that transition hmm. in some ways. Um, those of us who deal with fissile material in the industry have lived and breathed safeguards controls from day one. Um, you know, uranium has been, uh, you know, it's been given a lesser uh, regulatory uh, level over the years. You talk about prudent management versus actual physical protection, um, you know, and more stringent safeguard measures. As that starts to shift, there's an element of education that has to be done even within our industry. And I think we're, we're finally seeing the uranium miners starting to understand what the additional protocol looks like. What does material control and accountancy look like? What is it involved? How do you do it? And that's a fairly arcane uh, you know, bit of regulatory practice. Are, so one question that comes to mind, you know, today we can take our cell phones and walk into a supermarket and mm -hmm. scan things and get all, so, so information technology has gone crazy, right? So will that make any of this kind of accounting easier or cheaper or, and understanding that uranium mining in some countries is really kind, very atavistic. I mean, they're, they're miners, right? They're not high, it, uh, not all of it's quite no, high I mean, tech. I, I think you know, one of the observations I'd make about uranium, it's, it's different from the balance of the nuclear fuel cycle in several ways. You know, one, you might have five converters, you have five major enrichers, you have slightly more fuel fabricators, but you've got literally just tens and tens and tens of mines and mining companies all over the world. So you've got a, a different volume of entities that you're trying to capture and educate. Um, 
you know, a lot of those companies, uranium is not their primary business. It's a byproduct of copper mining or some other commodity-based business that they have. And so uh, uranium is a sideline at best and maybe not one uh, where those people are not you know, steeped in what the nuclear industry is and, and all these other things that come along with it. Um, you know, and the other fact is it's just, it's, it's where it's located, it's in the ground. This is not something that you get the technology for and you go and build where you think you need it. It is where it is and then you've got to get it to somewhere else. Um, so you take all of that and then you start to add on the additional layer. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a little hard for some of these mining companies to figure out, well, how do I do that and why isn't it just, I think you said, Cindy, a commodity like every other commodity like tantalum or selenium or copper or something like that. And this is one of the things we come across with, with industry as well, is that why isn't, we want uranium to be treated like any other commodity, but it's the only commodity that's regulated internationally um, because it, is, it does make nuclear weapons. This is uh, not uh, something you can get away from. Uh, and it's what uh, regulators, of course, are, are um, um, have to, uh, have oversight on, and it's not just the environmental and, and safety sides of things, but it's also making sure that this goes to where it is supposed to go for peaceful purposes. Uh, and, and that is an incredibly important part. And just on the, the technology side of things, uh, I, am, I, I was surprised uh, at, at a variety of different sites, uh, not all of them certainly, that it still works in a ledger system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and even with, with the reporting requirements for the imports and exports, it, it's actually been faxes to the regulator and then the regulator has to take it and put it into a different system and then that goes to the IAEA. And that has just been starting to be addressed. Uh, and these reporting requirements have been around since 1972. So uh, it's, well, depending on the country, of course. But so, I mean, we are a long way behind, I think, on getting the technology to come up to be able to facilitate inventory controls in a much more efficient way, and it will reduce cost. I mean, Sherry, you know, one of the things we look at from the information side is, is tracking. I mean, we look at that um, for the material that we ship, uh, both natural uranium that's been entrusted to us by our utility customers uh, and our actual low enriched uranium product that we're delivering to our utilities. Um, and you know, there are ways to track that, but one of the things to recognize is that the transport environment is actually a fairly hostile one. You know, these containers are being put on ships out in the ocean, and you, know, you may think, well, you get RFID tags, and you know, I see them in all sorts of other products. They don't do very well, you know, transversing you know, across the, the oceans and across cold environments, um, and they don't really withstand some of the conditions that you get in the processing plants themselves. Those are largely optional requirements at the moment in any case, um, and they're not cheap. I mean, we spend a tremendous amount of money tracking our shipments. Uh, we do that. Um, it's an extra regulatory determination by our company because we think it's worthwhile because it's a very expensive, valuable product in addition to having the security implications. Um, and in some cases, we're trying to make sure we're going to not you know, lose somebody's material um, on route. So, but not everybody has the ability or the finances at hand to do that. Right. So before I open it up to, to all of your questions, I have to ask this, Cindy. Uh-oh. So what's the coolest piece of information <laughs> you found in this? I mean, we, we, we found some interesting things in our you know, governing uranium in the United States report, but as you look across, you know, the entire, the great thing about this website is it makes uranium sexy, right? So, so what, what are some of the, the kind of most interesting things you didn't know about uh, before you started this project? Oh, I didn't know a lot. Uh, I think, um, you, you know, entering the front end is, is something that we kind of think, well, it comes out of the ground and then it gets processed and then we become interested um, because of, then it becomes more of a proliferant uh, issue. But I think what, well, one, actually how a professional um, uh, the majority of these sites are. Um, and, and also how open, in industry, to be honest, has been very welcoming, opening their doors for us to come to these facilities, uh, see refining plants, mills. And so there hasn't been any kind of veil that comes over as soon as we're knocking on doors and sending emails. There has been a little bit of skepticism um, to start off with. And, and, but then once they realize that we're, we're trying to understand 
uh, and, and not rank and not condemn. And it's, it's about understanding how things are governed, particularly since the IEEA is starting to move forward. So we need a baseline. I think the, I mean, the tracking part, and, it, and it's probably more the gaps that, that come out. Uh, the tracking part, for example, one conversion facility, when these drums come into conversion, they can hang out there for five to 10 years before they get fed. Uh, so, and, and like I said, like it's just like a, a sticker with a marker um, written what's in the drum. And, and so after five to 10 years, that gets weathered away. So while there, of course, there is a reconciliation when a drum comes into a conversion plant and everything gets reconciled and it's all good in the books, when it comes time to actually feed that material, they, might, they won't know who, what it is because it's been rubbed off. And I think that is something that industry should be concerned about. It's not just a matter of once it gets through the gate and then, okay, we're done. Uh, the responsibility does keep going further down. And actually what, it, what I was very, what was cool to see is how this one conversion facility is trying to do a pilot project to be able to change that approach. Uh, because obviously it has an impact on their business, particularly if you're feeding flagged material. Uh, and then just going to these facilities, I mean the size, the scale, uh, and, and how they work in these incredible environments. Uh, and, and, and it is a, kind of a, what would you call it, a conveyor belt system, right? I mean, it, it does work uh, incredibly well. And, and they're very proud to talk about their work and, and how they do it safely and securely. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to actually be working with them through the, through the whole thing. Great. What's next for this website? Well, this is the, you know, the starting point uh, for, for this. Uh, as we do not have a safety and environmental side. It's something we have been uh, told would be great. A lot of suggestions to for using that. So it is going to remain static for about a year. It is updated up until uh, basically December last year. I need to get more money. Funding is always an issue. Uh, and, and then we'll add a, and as you can see, I mean, we can, the way that CSIS uh, Ideas Lab has put it together is that we can build on this. So a safety and environmental side, and then also to really build up the safeguards information uh, and take that forward. So I think as of starting next year around this time or March-ish, and then going for a year, year and a half, two years, it will be built up uh, over time and become hopefully the resource out there on all things very front end. And people's comments and suggestions can be sent where? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, anytime. Yeah. So let's open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, Steph, that from you. <laughs> oh, wait for the microphone. Uh, Stephanie Cook with uh, Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Um, I have a question either for Cindy or Melissa um, on these additions. I, I came late, so apologies if I'm asking you to repeat yourself, but this business of what's been going on since 2003 to bring additional safeguards, I guess, what you're saying, down to the uranium level. Mm -hmm. um, given that most uranium companies have to do some accounting, you know, for their annual quarterly reports, pounds produced, et cetera, and ton, tonnage is mined, what actually do they have to do that they don't do now, most of them anyway? And, and have you been able to put a cost per pound on these additional requirements? If you could just explain what they're going to, what it's looking like that they're going to have to do, and then any cost estimates, that would be great. I'll, I'll start. And yeah, so uh, in in 2003, when it was moved to the urinal nitrate part, uh, because it was in the middle of the process, or kind of in the beginning of the process, and let's take Blind River as an example, um, what the Canadians did was said, well, we can't kind of start safeguards in the middle. How do you do that? How do you actually put a, a math figure on there? And particularly since they were getting waste material also coming in. So you can't have an unsafeguarded stream and a safeguarded stream of material. Uh, so then they said, okay, we'll start, as soon as we take the drum and we dump it into Blind River, full material accountancy and control. So everything from there on in is reported, accounted for, and given to the IAEA, and to the regulator and to the IAEA. Can you back up for a second? Blind River, I don't know if we have a graphic on here yeah, that will the, show it that. It was the, the transport, the one that went up to Canada. It's the, yeah, the Canadian. Yeah. So Blind River there is taking the... Drums. The drums, which hold what? Uh, uranium ore concentrates. Uranium ore concentrates and feeds them into a, it's a chemical process. 
uh, and refines it and turns it into what we call UO3. Okay. Most conversion facilities have the refining process and the conversion process together. Uh, for a variety of reasons in Canada, it is split between Blind River and then after UO3, then it goes to Port Hope, about, what, 2,000 kilometers away. Do we have a graphic that shows the different stages and the chemical composition? Yeah, we have that fuel cycle. Fuel cycle check? Fuel cycle. That'll be good. There it is. So, yeah. so there's basically two streams. So once you get, uh, so the trucks go in, uh, and then from conversion, then you have either goes to uh, uranium dioxide for fuel fabrication into a nuclear power plant, or it gets enriched through. So by, with, with policy paper 18 in 2003, Stephanie, it was uh, by starting at that point from when the drum enters, it left out all the tens of thousands of drums from, that was not part of it. Uh, now with the IAEA, they're looking at clarifying basically the purity level. Uh, and, and there is still a lot of work to be done on this in, in terms of what it means, uh, how is the IAEA going to put this effort into the money, it's always cash strapped, um, and then looking at how, what is currently already in place, and then what needs to be done better. I mean, we're in the beginning of this, of this process. The purity level, yeah. So it's trying, because with basically what, uh, without trying to get too technical, um, but the, the reporting requirements or the starting point is when the material is what we consider isotopically uh, enriched or ready or for fuel pure. Pure, pure. <laughs> yeah, uh, to, to be fed, ready to be, to be used as fuel. And, and of course, over the years, uh, we have technologically advanced, uh, so there are products that are coming out that are almost ready to be fed. Uh, into um, it, it, it part depends upon the, the grade of the the ore and the ground, yeah. and then what they need to do to purify it to get it ready for fuel cycle use. So you're saying that the purity level, the uranium could come. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not ore, not yeah. rock. When this decision might be made, or sorry, just when the decision might be made, or what's the timing on this? It's essentially a work in progress. It, it is a work in progress, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it is under development at the moment. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Stephanie, we, you know, we do have the, the additional protocol coming into use, which is now requiring you know, that uranium mills, for example, report in far more detail um, you know, what it is they're doing, how much they plan to export, uh, you know, what they are actually exporting year on in. Um, and of course, you know, now we of course have the potential for complementary inspection, complementary access by the IAEA. Um, and so that, that is still fairly new for that sector of the industry. But I, I have not heard to your question a specific, you know, price per pound of what that adds on. And I suspect it's going to vary dramatically for a company like Cameco, uh, which operates the Blind River facility, or, you know, a new Malawian mining entity. How, how big a threat is this? How big a concern is this? Has, and let me back that up by asking a earlier question, which is, has some of this material gone missing <laughs> in different places? And, and why? I know one answer to that. <laughs> we, have, we have one example on, on, uh, on the site of the Plumbat affair, and that goes way back. Uh, that goes back to before, actually, uh, international safeguards came in. And, and this was a case where material was diverted from Germany. It was supposed to be going to Italy uh, to a port there, and it never ended up getting there. And instead, it ended up basically in the, in the Demona reactor in Israel. Um, now, Euratom did have safeguards in place at the time. But, uh, and this is where kind of, you know, the geopolitics and, and everything else comes in. Europe at the time was kind of fighting with each other. Uh, they do that uh, from time to time. Um, and, and so there... There, it should have been more efficient and, and pick this up, uh, and, but it did uh, get through. So we don't really have those kinds of cases. I have heard um, that industry loses amounts. Um, it's, it's not something that they like to talk about, but it's also part of kind of the process in the business when you've got these huge volumes of rock. Uh, it goes through, it gets crushed and milled and and, and so it's really, it's not something where you can say we put in this amount of tons of rock and then this came out and it's a perfect mathematical equation. Um, but the other, I think, problem or challenge would be is that the regulators 
have these very small minimum amounts that have to be reported if they're lost. There is a self-reporting requirement, uh, and Australia, Canada, and the United States, for example, all have these very minimum or none. Um, no amounts are allowed to be lost, but they've never had a self-report. And, and you can kind of understand why, because why would you do a report for 15 pounds? Uh, I mean, imagine the amount of paperwork, but at the same time, it would be good so that we could actually understand the process. And so the, challenges. the reporting requirement is so low that people don't take it seriously. Exactly. Because it would just be in the wash. There was a case in the United States where some quantity of material was up for sale, and there was a prosecuted case. I think we, we put that in our, back in the 70s, if I recall, um, and that's in the governing uranium in the US report. But the question that we come to, there's safeguards, which is where you're thinking somebody might, either an insider or a country, such as in the Plumbat affair, might divert material. But then there's just the question of security. Um, and you're, in order to put enough material together that would, would presume that you need, you have processing facilities somewhere, it's a lot of it's a lot of material, right? It's truckloads, ten truckloads worth, I think, if you're coming from a mine. Well, and even just talking, sorry, I should have addressed your question of the threat. Uh, I mean, a drum is 400 pounds, right? I mean, it's it's not something you can walk out with, um, and and you do need insider assistance. Um, there was this case in in Namibia where it was um, a police sting. Uh, to go in and kind of check the, the, the security of, of one of the facilities. And there was not the same checks for damaged drums as there was for the product drums. So actually insiders were able to utilize that to remove and sell um, the damaged drums. So these are the kinds of things that just because it's heavy and yeah, it still needs to be processed and everything else, and, and we recognize that you can't use this and then make a nuclear weapon, um, but it has a huge psychological impact. And I don't think you will ever see your secret services move so fast if there are drums of uranium missing. Yeah. I, mean, I think, you know, I was just gonna elaborate. Uh, maybe there was a question. Go back to Tom. Elaborate and then we'll bring the yeah. microphone what up to What I was Tom. gonna say is, you know, one of the, the differences we see is the control on the material at the processing site. Okay? Once it actually leaves and goes further into the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, you get a, a tremendous application of tracking mechanisms that are done for a variety of reasons. Some of them are contractual, some of them are financial, some of them are in fact safeguards, some even come from trade restrictions on dealing with sanctioned entities or material subject to anti-dumping control. So there's a, a phenomenal amount of paperwork that happens, but only once it gets out of the mine site and into the rest of the fuel cycle. Yeah. Um, Melissa, I want to challenge uh, what I took is the implication that this could be very costly and mining, the mining industry wouldn't see, uh, look kindly on that. <clears throat> First, you said we're in a slump in terms of spot price. Sure. I would remind you that the long-term constant dollar price of uranium has not gone up. It's it spiked a couple of times, but it's essentially been steady since the 50s. So your $38 a pound is, divide that by seven or eight, and you get back to the AEC prices in the 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. so forth. So, <clears throat> The second point is that you, you haven't discussed at all the environmental costs associated with any of these. Sure. The number one country that you put up on the chart was Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has essentially no regulation, environmental regulations, worker safety regulations over this industry. A lot, of, a lot if not most, of their mining is in situ leach. The cost of reclamation uh, or doing it right would swamp the cost of whatever reporting requirements you're talking about as being uh, 
onerous on the industry. Now, in the United States, in, in situ leach, EPA has, as we speak, a proposed rule to increase the um, uh, environmental monitoring for in situ leach. Those costs would swamp any safeguards costs associated with tracking material after it's turned into U308. But, um, so I, I just think the cost issue is, a, is kind of, a, in terms of safeguards, is, is a phony issue. I think you should branch out and look at the environmental aspects of this industry, which on an international basis are pretty atrocious, particularly with regard to in situ leach mining. I know NRDC has been involved in a lawsuit in the United States, which we're appealing to the commission as we speak, uh, over the environmental aspects of in situ leach in the US. And other countries like Kazakhstan, it's non-existent. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I mean, Tom, I'll just make a few comments on that. I mean, you're, you're right. I remember, uh, you know, when you'd hear the uranium miners say, man, if the uranium price gets to $10, then we're going to have all this material. If it gets to $16. But a lot of those resources have since been mined, and so the entities that are looking now at market price, they really aren't even remotely possible until you get to a higher dollar price. And I'm not a specialist on the mining side. Um, and there's no doubt that the market price of uranium, it reflects what somebody's willing to pay for it, not what all the externalities are that are involved in that. Um, and, and there's no doubt that if you were to get a group of uranium miners in the room, they're going to be uh, far more apoplectic about the pending EPA rules than they are about the, the cost of, of doing MCNA work. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Amica makes best mine trucks for 50 miles. Mm -hmm. My truck. The mill. And just compare the cost of hauling all of that ore to the mill to the paperwork involved in monitoring some canisters of U308 at the mill. It's just, you know, this is a, a phony issue that it costs too much. To do the it costs too much. I think there's a fear that they don't know what it involves. Yes, yeah. right. So, so we are running a little short on time, so I, we're going to take a few questions at the same time. I know I saw one back there, others, and then these two, and then we'll have our, okay, so there are two over here and two over there. So first the gentleman and then the young lady in front of her. Uh, so let's take all the questions together. Sure. Uh, relatively quickly, you've described um, Who are basically, you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brian DiNuno, uh, Department of Energy. Um, You've described a sort of a very narrow set of conversion facilities that are more regulatory savvy, and then sort of dozens or hundreds of mines which are, are less aware. And I'm just wondering exactly where is the seam in terms of when the material is owned? When it leaves the mills and is being shipped these thousands of miles, is at that point, is it owned by the conversion facility, or do they not take ownership till it actually arrives at the conversion facility? And is that seam one of the things that you're, you're really looking at? Okay, next question right in front. We're going to take all the questions together. Um, hi, um, my name is Emily Ralston. Um, my, my question is, uh, considering how tightly uh, stretched the IAEA already is, both in terms of manpower um, and financial resources, do they actually have the capacity to um, do all of the various steps that would be involved in expanding um, the processes under their purview, considering um, the constraints they already have? Good question. And then we had two on this side. Brian, sorry, Brian Corder, nuclear fuel trader. Um, question is, so the Iranians all already own a share of a mine in Namibia. So it's not like they can't access yellow cake if they want it. But we all know that the process to make a nuclear weapon is very complex. Um, so my question is, if you have a mining company, their, their goal, like any other company, is not lose product, just like Target doesn't want people shoplifting from them, right? Um, so wouldn't it be better just to let them regulate themselves instead of putting on these, these, these uh, international regulations? Okay, and then one last question. 
Good morning. I'm, my name is Scott Morgan. Uh, I have a question going back to Africa. You know, in the past, one of the largest suppliers of uranium was the DRC, and considering the weak mining regulations there, I was, I was kind of surprised to see that you were not interested in what has been going on in the Congo, considering it was the source of the material that was used in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. I was wondering, is that still a concern, or is that a country you're going to be looking into in the future? Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, I'll take the first one on the ownership chain, uh, because once it's produced, it's actually probably never owned by the converter or the enricher. What happens is uh, nuclear utilities go out and they procure various materials and processing services throughout that nuclear fuel cycle. So it may be that uh, as soon as it's produced, it's sold to a utility, which then has it moved to the conversion facility, it procures the conversion services, has that material then moved on to an enrichment facility and so on. But it's typically the utility that has that ownership um, throughout the entire processing stage. On the IEEA, is it stretched beyond capacity? I mean, across the board, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, and, and I think this is, where, this is where, when we're talking about it being in development, they have a lot of their own research to do as to how they are going to apply the, the new starting point and how they're going to be able to actually uh, mobilize uh, their inspectors, if I could use that term. I have heard that inspection itself isn't that costly. Um, and I don't know in terms of relation to whatever, but uh, it also would help then, this is where the inventory can controls come in, because if we can move from a ledger system and a fax system, um, then we could certainly have something that can go into the IEEA and make it more you know, digitalized. Of course, I understand there are cyber issues and security issues there, uh, but at least in terms of more real-time uh, reporting. So this is a process uh, that we're going through, and we'll have to ask that question again in a year or two or three or five. Uh, on Iran and Namibia, uh, actually, the, they, they've owned 15% of Rossing, uh, but they have no access to the board, they have no access to information, to documents, and it's been, well, since bef just before sanctions, or, but certainly since sanctions, uh, that they've had that, they haven't had any access. So there's nothing from Rossing that goes to uh, uh, Iran. And the, the export control system would prohibit that in the first case. Yeah. So, uh, but, but your question in terms of self-regulation, um, no. Uh, if, if we're, and particularly since we're talking about, we've got eight majors uh, in, in the mining company. They're across all countries. And, and so they're ha they themselves say they use their own standards across all these countries. And there's a reason for it, because standardization is a good thing. Uh, it helps all their automated systems, their own reporting internal, and it'd be the same thing for looking at the IAEA. There's a reason why we regulate uranium. And self-regulation uh, is not something that, from a non-proliferation perspective, has had great dividends in the past, globally. And on the last question, on the oh, Belgian Congo? on DRC, yeah. I mean, picking 15 countries, which ones are we going to focus with? Uh, I mean, obviously, you could you know, go for 25, 30, all the historical ones, and, and keep on going, going, going. We've had questions about why didn't you go with the Czech Republic and with Wismut and Germany. And, and, and we're trying to focus on this shifting current. So DRC is, is a while ago. Uh, and, but in the Africa report that is published, and actually, Paul, if you wouldn't mind just showing the, the bottom page there, yeah, and clicking on the DIS website itself, uh, the governing uranium one. Sorry. If you go back, yeah, so you have the link at the end there, up top, the DIS one, all information for this project, yeah. So all of the governing uranium reports are there, and the Africa report that was done by CIPRI uh, in August, uh, sorry, December 2013, in there, there does have a little bit of the history and, and going through the continent as a whole. It does focus on the four uh, countries at the moment, but it, it does do that historical overview. So thank you, uh, first off, to Cindy and Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> but Thanks to all of you uh, for coming out this morning. We welcome your comments, uh, your suggestions, and um, stay tuned here. We're going to have a, another report that we're releasing in March, a bigger report on the nuclear fuel cycle and a new approach to that. And uh, be sure to look for an invitation in your email. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys.